This is a normal drumstick. This is a broomstick. This is a normal kick drum beater. And this is a fluffy beater. Well, hello there, my name is John Meyer. This is episode two in my new series where I break down the why and the how of the composing and recording process of a production music track or a music library track. In the last episode, we talked about why I'm writing this track in the first place, you know, the overall vibe, the theme, the sound, and we specifically focused on the ins and outs of recording the acoustic guitar. My goal for this project is to record all the parts out of the box, meaning no virtual instruments, no software instruments, and I've been playing the acoustic guitar for 30 plus years, but the drums, well, that's a different story. One school of thought is to get somebody else to play the drums, and that's probably the best decision. And for years, that's what I did. I learned from a guy named Joel Cameron who's been on this channel numerous times, fantastic drummer. So I learned the engineering side, getting sounds, lots of outboard gear to tweak while he was playing drums. So it just made sense for him to do it. And I relied on him for that. And because of that, I didn't learn much about them at all. But since I'm in my house now and I've got a kit at my disposal, I thought it was time to get to work. I'm a big believer that learning to play an instrument, even on the most basic level, and even if you never record a note yourself, will only help you when you open up the computer and go to software instruments and virtual instruments. You'll understand more, and especially if you bring in a player that's got real talent, you'll be able to have a conversation that will get you closer to where you want to go. Check, check, check on the microphone. Checking on the mic to see if there's a buzz when I play back. So why soft drums? Well, I love the sound. And one of the first instruments that I shared with you all was soft drums. It's in contact format. You have to have the full player or you can have decent sampler. If you're new to all this, go check out my website. But it's a free instrument full of soft drum samples. And I might be working on something new, but you gotta stay tuned. But let's say there's two main reasons that I'm going for this sound. And the first I'm gonna call feedback. And I don't wanna go on and on about how I'm not a great drummer. I'm okay. But when you play with sticks and you hit the drums hard, there's, there's a feedback, right? It jumps back at you. When you hit a hi-hat, it jumps back at you. And so it's easier to do quite a bit more with one of these sticks than it is to do with this. When you hit the head, it just kind of splats. And it's not really made to be fast. I mean, yes, you can work on some nuances with the sound of these brushes on the head, which is really nice. But I felt like this could fit in my skill set a little bit better and that I could not master, but I could at least play to a click on the two and the four and work on some of those subtleties and bring it to life in a way that might be a little more challenging with this, even though you can play quiet with sticks. But that leads to the second point, which is dynamics. There's no doubt that if I hit a cymbal with this and even a snare and tom, it's going to be louder. Or if I use this beater, it's gonna be louder obviously than if I use something like this or these sticks. My friend Steve, Steve Solomon, taught me a long time ago that there's a relationship between big guitars, you know, dirty distortion, and open hi-hats and crashes. And the more you do one or the other, you kind of have to match it, right? If you have big distortion, you need to match it with really hitting on the hi-hats. There's a relationship there. So by taking that away, that means big guitars probably are not part of this equation. And I've just decided that it doesn't really fit the theme and the instrumentation that I want to hear in these songs. So now I can still have dynamics. I can still change the way that I play from soft to quiet, but the distance isn't as great as it would be if I had sticks. And so I can then take these instruments that I want to use in this project, mandolin, lap steel, acoustic guitar, and use those. And even, even shakers and tambourines, like light percussion instruments, use those to really manipulate the dynamics. But these broomsticks help kind of contain what I'm trying to do. And the third reason, I like the sound. I think it's pretty cool. Before I talk more specifically about the drums, I want you to hear something. We are in my control room. You've seen it all before if you have been around. And I'm gonna hold this mic out in front of me the same distance. So now we're in my control room. It's very heavily treated, it's very dead. When we walk out into the entryway or foyer of my house, you can notice that it's drastically different and it's brighter. I like using this space for some things. If you look way up high, the ceiling goes up to kind of the second floor area. It's an awkward space. It's only about eight feet wide and very tall. There's a lot of weird reflections, but it's actually kind of nice. And I like recording drums out here when I want a bigger sound. 
But now we'll walk into my drum room and I'd say it's a nice in between. And that's not exactly why I chose this space. I chose it because the drums are in here. Normally the drums are right here on this rug and I set them up in such a way that I can use this space for other things. I store all my equipment in here and that way it's always set up and always mic'd up. In fact, that's an important point when discussing this project. I would have mic'd up the drums different if I was setting up from scratch, but I mic'd them in such a way that I was using other mics in the other room at the time and I didn't want to move things around. I wanted to keep things set up without it all being in the way. So I definitely made some compromises, not huge compromises. I think it sounds really good, but if I was starting from scratch, I would have set the drums up in a different way, set the mics in a different way, and maybe even chosen different mics. And this is an old Slingerland kit. Oh, I only have one tom, and I have this kick drum here, and then we've got this snare drum that came with it, a 16 inch, I believe, floor tom. I love this ride. It's a pre-age dry light K series. And then we have a Zildjian custom dark crash 18 inch, and these custom dark hi-hats. These are Promark broomsticks. You can pull that down and you can get a flatter, a more brushy sound, or you can get a tighter sound if you move that up. For the snare on my left hand, I would open it up a bit more like this. And for my right hand, for the hi-hat, it just felt, it was easier. Now on the kick drum, Jordan, if you can get around here, I've got this fluffy beater, which is an, another way that I can play soft. For quite a few of these songs, I hit it as light as I possibly could, and, but you could dig into it some, but it was just another way to bring that overall dynamic level down. With these, you have to pay attention to the way the overhead sound, because you can't get the volume out of this with sticks, but you can get a good volume here. So you have to really listen back. And that's one thing that just being an audio engineer for so many years is that there are often times we record somebody and they play the hi-hat way too loud or they hit their cymbals too loud or they hit their drums too loud. And so you've gotta be willing to go back and forth and record some and make the decision based on uh, what you hear in the other room. Okay, I need to hit the cymbals harder. Now, uh, I wanted a darker sound and I, didn't, I don't want a real present splashy cymbal sound, so it kind of worked out great. Because of the way it's set up, I run a cable from my headphone system through the hallway, and I have headphones set up, and then I take my iPad. I basically use it for start and stop transport controls. I set that on a music stand right next to me, and then I that, that limits the amount of time that I have to run back and forth. Now, it seems like I have to run back and forth a lot. I've even considered putting preamps in here that I could control instead of having to run back and forth, but uh, I don't do it enough for that to make much sense. This is the first track that I recorded, and I remember specifically that I put this on loop recording, and or I thought I had, and I played it probably 15 times, walked in here and realized that I had not recorded. So I set it back up again and recorded it twice, and I felt like I got what I wanted. The nice thing about this part is that it's repetitive, so if there's sections that I wanna copy around, I probably could, but I ended up having to do some basic editing. Again, this is not an editing tutorial, but let's, let's look at the kick and the snare. Here's my performance, and you can see that I am ahead of the beat for most of the time, okay? Sometimes I'm on it, sometimes I'm off. And if I played it like this the entire time, I don't know how much I would edit. This style of music can be a little loose. When you get all the instruments together, it'll feel right. If you're a little bit ahead of the beat on the drums, not a big deal. But if you're ahead of the beat, and then the next measure you're behind the beat, and then you're ahead of the beat and behind the beat, well, that's wrong. And you just gotta fix it. So people talk about what is perfection in music, and you have to be smart enough to know that it can be bad or slightly ahead or slightly behind, and that could be great. But if you're varying your performance because you don't have the skill with your foot or your hands to match up what you're trying to play, then that's when you've got to edit. I am not scared to edit. Now, this was a project about recording outside of the box, but I said nothing about editing inside the box. So in this particular playlist, this is after I used Beat Detective to chop it up into segments. And if you really want a beat detective tutorial, go look for one. Maybe I could do that. I, it's not really what I want to do, but I'll do it if you ask. And I moved these 
So if you notice here, let's just jump back and forth between this first hit from this playlist and the previous playlist. You can see how much I moved it. This one barely moved at all, and that one moved probably 50% of the way, maybe 60% of the way. So I'm not locking it in completely, but I am moving it. And then I had to go through and make adjustments in case there was some weird hi-hat clips. But for the most part, I probably, since this was such a simple part, I probably selected the whole thing and did one passive beat detective, and I imagine it was pretty close. I'm gonna go ahead and duplicate this, leaving those edits, and then I'm gonna consolidate it so you can briefly kind of hear the part. About as simple as you get. Kick, snare, kick, snare, kick, snare, but I'm adding a subtle amount of nuance with my left hand. It's kind of hard here. I'm focusing on staying with the click and being consistent. Uh, let's see the B section. Basic fill. Same kick and snare pattern, but I'm hitting the ride instead of the hi-hat. Then we've got something here. Just threw a tom in. The idea was that the track going back into this A section would have a pause. So I have a simple snare fill. Bam. Did I change things up for the second B section? You can see that I'm playing quarter notes on the kick now. which is surprisingly difficult because getting that kick and the snare to line up is, is a challenge. <laughs> kind of sloppy if you listen to it by itself. And I need to go through in the mix and make sure everything's in phase. I don't even know if I've touched it since I recorded it. But in the context, I'm happy with the part and I think it fits the overall sound that I was going for. One thing, since I played this, I don't really need to impress myself Sometimes another drummer might want to do more to show that they can, and I'm perfectly content in knowing that I want the emphasis to be on one of the other tracks, and I want this to be almost sound like a drum machine, but with more life and character and mistakes. I know it's hard to watch this and think, well, I don't have all that John has. You do need some gear, or you need access to gear, or you need friends that have gear. And if you're like me, you buy a little bit of gear every year. And after 25 years or so, you have a nice collection of microphones and instruments. So now that I'm not limited so much by what I don't have, and I can focus on making the best music possible. I was going to talk about bass this week, but there's enough here. I'll come back with that in the next episode. Take care.